Hey, hey. Still me. Still me up here. I, uh, <laughs> my name's Jeremy. Um, uh, my wife and I, Katie, right here, my family, we moved down here, what, a little over a year and a half, something like that. Um, back down to Southern California, this journey, we joined Alan and Catherine Scott. Alan and Catherine, they're not here this morning. They are still in a purgatory. They're in a... <laughs> They're in Hawaii. Um, I know, it's so, so tough. Um, we were actually just there with them um, earlier this week. We, uh, we did a leaders retreat um, with just us and the Lowe's. Um, and um, I know some of you guys were concerned for, for our, our welfare and our well-being. I just want to let you know I wanted to comfort your hearts and just all the challenges. It was a little humid, and um, that, was, that was something we had to overcome. And um, there was a few bugs we had to swat while we sat on the beach, and that was also really, really hard. But we're here, we have pressed in, we have fixed our eyes on, on the, the joy set before us. And, and <laughs> yeah, I know, you're, you're, yeah, be proud. Um, so Alan and Catherine, they're still there, and they're doing a conference there, which is amazing. And, um, but it was such a good, it was actually, I, I know none of us, is, none of you guys are feeling compassion for us, but it was actually such an, <laughs> such an important time for us as a leadership community. I don't know how many guys know, but we started this journey as strangers in so many ways, like people who knew each other from afar, but weren't deeply connected. Um, and we kind of, it's kind of like, uh, I, I can almost compare it to like a shotgun wedding where you know, you see the promise of it, you know, but you might have to walk through a few things in, you know, in the process. But it has been such a joy to get to know Alan and Catherine. You can see the integrity, you can see the character, but learning how to walk with them, learning how they're moving. And this journey, I, I feel like you, you may be wondering, you know, what it feels like to be on the other side of it, but it almost feels like it's happening to us at the same time as it's happening to you, you know, um, which has been amazing. But We've been doing a series on repentance, which is not your normal series, you know, <laughs> definitely not. It's, um, but it's been a holy moment. I'm so curious. I haven't had much of a chance to dialogue with you guys about how that's felt or what you felt as far as um, uh, Alan just going after repentance. It's, it's, I found myself um, on the floor in one of these times. Um, where it was just, it was particularly, it was on a Sunday night and it was such a holy moment. I don't even think it was, Alan was intentionally even steering it in a certain direction, but what we just began to respond to the Lord and people began to come up front and prostrate themselves and lay themselves before the Lord and just confess, start confessing stuff. And, and, and it was like, yeah, it was like the spirit of repentance came in such a heavy way. And I, I think what I found odd it, almost surreal it, is that in my head, I'm going, this is all over the Bible. This is all over. It talks about uh, times of repentance. It talks about a returning to the Lord. It talks about all this stuff. But I don't think I've ever been a part of a community that's done this in a focused way. And there's something really, really holy about it. I feel like we're in a season, guys, of preparation, of consecration unto the Lord. And I just want to say this, if you're joining us for the first time, we're not uh, into repentance because we're like masochistic or anything like that. We're not gluttons for punishment. We don't want to just repent for repentance sake. Um, although actually we do want to repent for repentance sake, but I want to say we also want to do it for the joy set before us. It's because we're hungry for what the Lord actually has in store for us. And we want our house and we want our lives to be in order on the day of his visitation. We want to be a people who are postured and prepared for an outpouring of a spirit so that we can be stewards and not squanderers of it. And we're not here to play church. I've done a lot of church. I've played a lot of church. We're here to go after God. We're here to go after the inbreaking of his kingdom here in this region with everything that we have because the time is short and the need is great and we don't want to miss our moment. And um, second reason I think we want to go after repentance um, is just consecration. Another way of, of talking about repentance is just to talk about consecration, being consecrated afresh to the Lord. And if you know anything about the process of consecration, it's a tedious one. And in the middle of it, honestly, it's like you don't have a lot to show for it. You just, you're like things are being stripped away. How many guys have ever been in a season of pruning? 
And you know the Lord is doing a significant work. And you can get all the people to tell you how significant of a work the Lord is doing. But in, in the meantime, in the middle of it, you're just like, yeah, but I'm like four branches less <laughs> than what I was before. It does not feel super fulfilling. It's a tedious process. It's a pruning process. But what is it unto? More fruit. More fruit. And it's why it's so important in this process of consecration where we as a community, we're setting ourselves apart for the Lord that we remember that the goal is habitation. The goal is the infilling of the glory of the Lord, His coming close. I don't know if you guys have ever read or uh, been caught up in the book of Exodus. Anyone been caught up in the book of Exodus? So many amen, so many raised hands. I, I, um, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, the book of Exodus is actually not the most boring book in the, in, the, in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible. But there is this, Leviticus is much harder to wade through. If you, if you, I'll just challenge you there. The book of Exodus, though, the thing that was so intriguing to me, I remember reading it and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. You have, it's all about the creation and the building of, of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. And there's just so many tedious details. You got all this instruction, so much acacia wood. You got the table for the bread. You got the golden lampstand. You got the curtains and they're all shapes and sizes and number. Um, you have these clasps. They, I mean, the Bible goes into intense detail. Isn't that so funny? The things that the Bible goes into detail on and the things the Bible does not go into detail on. It's like, and God said, let there be light. And there it was, there was light. And then God said, let there be trees and birds and all that kind of a thing. You want the, you know, him to expand a little bit more on that. But here, when it talks about the tabernacle, it's like every little detail. It's like, and they overlaid this with bronze. And it just, I mean, right at the point that you're about to check out in the book of Exodus, there's this amazing verse that has rocked my world and hit me like a ton of bricks. It says this, it says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And here's just something I just want to encourage. Consecration always precedes glory. If you're hungry for the more of God, if you're hungry for more of him in your life, there's, there's this process that prepares us to be full of the glory of God. And that's this process of consecration. So I just want to say, take heart. If you're in the middle of this, if you're in, the, in this process, take heart. Don't give up. Let's keep setting ourselves apart to the Lord. Paul in his letter to Timothy, his second letter in uh, chapter two, verse 21 states this. He says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy and useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. He will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house. How? If he cleanses himself from what is dishonorable. And that's just our goal, isn't it? To be useful to the master of the house. That's what we're aiming for. So I want to press into this issue of purity. I have a huge burn for purity. I don't pretend to be an expert on all things purity, but Alan asked me to press into this, this, this topic of clean hands and a pure heart. And um, I, uh, I struck... Um, obviously, I think when we think about purity, we think about um, probably sinlessness or something shimmering white or undiluted or that kind of a thing. But I want to look at a slightly different piece, an aspect of purity that I think is so important for us in this walk. Because if we don't understand this part of purity, we'll never get to the actual, the sinlessness, the holiness, the, the walking in close connection to the Lord if we don't understand this aspect of purity. Um, I'm going to read Psalm 24. Verse three, three through four, it says, who shall ascend? And I'm so sorry. Normally I'd be throwing, you know, stuff up on there. I'm not a pro preacher yet. I, uh, I am, I, one of these days when I have a pro presenter, you'll know that the glory is just about to hit. It's about to descend. But today is not that day. It says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And it kind of begs the question, what is clean hands? What is the difference between clean hands and a pure heart? And to the best of my understanding, guys, when I look at the Bible, when the Bible talks about clean hands, it's talking about hands represent deeds. They represent, um, clean hands represents right living, the things that you do. Clean hands are hands that work righteousness, hands that um, do good things, not evil things, hands that abstain from sin meaning a life, it's your physical thing. Um, 
It's, it's not talking about your inner world. When the Bible talks about pure hearts, the distinction is it represents your inner world. It's talking about your thoughts, your intentions, your emotions, your desires. Pure hearts refers to the purity of your inner being. And I think it's a little easiest for, easier for us to understand purity in our, in our uh, when it comes to hands, when it comes to not doing bad things. I think we, we, we get that. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what most of us think of purity. We think of that's if we don't screw up, that, that we're doing good. We're headed towards purity. But not a whole lot of us understand what it looks like to be truly pure in heart. And I want to press into this because I found personally, just for me guys, and communally, that when a people press into having a pure heart, this is out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, which means out of the overflow of your heart, your body falls in line, your living falls in line with what's going on in your heart, right? Amen. Amen, Jer. So good. <laughs> Strong points. Um, oftentimes, um, well, here's the main thing that I want to propose to you guys. I want to propose that purity of heart is singleness of heart just as much as it is sinlessness of heart. Purity flows from singleness. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How many know that in the kingdom, guys, seeing has just as much to do with focus as it does with a functional pair of eyeballs? In effect, you see what you look for. How many guys have ever had that experience where you bought a new car that you think is completely unique? You can't even remember seeing that car on the road. And then you buy that new car. And all of a sudden, because it is the singular focus, what, what happens? You begin to see that car everywhere. I remember um, I went to a deal and I bought a Honda Odyssey. And this guy, he was a great salesman. He's like, this is like, he's like, this is the smoke, taupe, gray, something. I don't know what he said about it. But he's like, not many of this is out there. Not many colors. He's like, this one is unique. It stands, you know. And I'm, I'm just, I'm like, yeah, I haven't seen too many of these kinds of things. And then the second you drive it off the lot, all you see... It's like every mom and dad out there has a smoke gray odyssey. And um, is that because it didn't exist before? No, it's because you've, you just had eyes to see it. There was a focus. How many guys have ever had the Lord deal with a sin in your heart? and a sin in your life, and all of a sudden, the second he deals with it, it's like the scales fall off your eyes, and you recognize that other, every other human being in the church has that exact same sin issue. You guys ever had that experience? You're like, oh, you have it, and you have it. <laughs> Same could be said when you focus on the activity of God, you begin to see the activity of God everywhere. So curious, I remember reading the verse where it says, Jesus says, I only do what I see my Father doing. And I'm like, how did he, how did he see that? Well, I, I know that in part it's because of this. It was his one assignment. It was this one focus in life. He didn't have any other mission in life. It was just to do what I see my father doing. And how many know if that's your one goal, if your one thing, your whole eyes, everything about your life has a singular focus that all of a sudden you can see. Focus and seeing go hand in hand. Focus actually enables your eyes to see. Um, if you have a Bible, why don't you turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 19 through 24. I miss the days where Bibles rustled and pages rustled. It was just such a comforting sound. And now there's just nothing. There's nothing there um, except phones. <laughs> Who likes just having a physical Bible? Like, hold out there with me. Let's go physical, but yeah, that's, raise them. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Matthew chapter six, verses 19 through 24. These are three separate teachings and all of these are addressing in my estimation, they're addressing singleness in the area of focus, in the area of devotion, in the area of attention, the focus of our wealth, the focus of our eyes, the focus of our service. So I'm going to read it. Starting verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, that's what my ESV translation says. Other translations like the King James says, if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, blurry, clouded, out of focus, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Moving on to verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So what is Jesus dealing with here in these three passages? Well, I'll share my thoughts since I have the microphone. In my estimation, Jesus is dealing with the area of dualism. And I'll just say this, guys. One of the most crippling things for anyone seeking to live a kingdom life is dualism. Duality of heart is the ultimate stunter of growth and maturity in the Christian life. It is the thing that keeps us unfocused in our seeing and therefore rarely able to see. And I watch so many Christian guys get caught in this trap of trying to serve two masters because we really, we really, we really want to love God. We really do. Our hearts are, are like the intention is good. We have good intentions when it comes to the love of God, but we really want to love other things as well. We really want to serve the Lord with all of our hearts, but we actually want to serve a bunch of other things as well. We really want God's will to be done, except that we kind of want our will to be done too. We really want to follow Jesus with everything in us, but we kind of want to lead our lives as well. We want our cake and we want to eat it too. You guys know that that saying has never made any sense to me <laughs> until I finally Googled it and they explained it to me. It's like, oh, we want our cake, but then we want to eat it, but then we want to still have it. Except that after you eat it, you don't have it anymore. I'm like, that's profound. I've never, ever seen that. I don't know why, but that's so true. We want our cake and we want to eat it too, but then we want it to still exist and it's, it's gone. And this is kind of like this game that we begin to play. And oftentimes we do this, guys, because we've been fed the lie that it's possible for one, or we've allowed popular Christian culture or just Christian culture, whatever it is, to become our guide instead of Jesus' words. But let me just tell you, dualism may be where a lot of us live, but Jesus is making it clear that dualism doesn't work. And he's kind of stating the obvious here. He's like, you can't focus all your wealth on amassing earthly treasure, but then be like, but my heart lives in heaven. That actually doesn't work. How you steward your money will either create singularity in your life or it will create duality. You can't expect your eyes to see clearly when they're trying to focus on two things at once. How many guys have that gift where you can make your eyeballs go in different directions at, 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 the, at the same time? Um, it's one of the creepiest things in the world. Um, but we want crazy eyes. We want eyes that are able to be like divided, but we want to see clearly. And the, and the thing is that we just need to know that that's not going to happen. You can't actually have eyes going in two different directions and have a focused life. It's impossible. You can't serve two masters. At some point, you're either going to love one or you're going to hate the other. That's just how it's going to go. But we're trying to constantly keep two masters simultaneously enthroned on our hearts. We're like, you can share. There's the throne. It's right there. You can just cuddle up, get cuddly, and uh, it's there for you. But that, that just doesn't work. It's no, no more than when you try and give a toddler one toy and say, share this with another toddler. Dualism doesn't work, but we keep trying and oftentimes pretending that it is working. <laughs> David says this, he says, Lord, give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name, which means that the more our hearts are divided in their attention, the more that our hearts are divided in their focus, the more that our hearts are divided in our desires, the less of the fear of the Lord is in our hearts. And if there's anything we're pressing into in this season is that we have more of the fear of the Lord in our hearts. But the way that you get to the fear of the Lord is you deal with the division inside your heart. Soren Kierkegaard said this, purity of heart is to will one thing. James, the brother of Jesus, in his book to the church, also hammers this duality. And James hammers so beautifully and strongly 
you, you know, you have those books in the Bible where you don't like sign up to read them on purpose, you know? <laughs> uh, James, when, when, when I know my life needs, needs a good chiropractic adjustment, those are the books I sign up for. That in Hebrews, like I just go in, I'm like, okay, Lord, deal with me, have your way. But he says this, he says, salt water and fresh water cannot flow from the same source. Blessing and cursing. He's like, they can't, should not ever flow from the same mouth, except they do. Dualism. Friendship with the world. You can't be friends with the world and friends with God. It just doesn't work. He says this later on. He says, cleanse your hands, your life, your deeds. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Division in your pursuits, in your thinking. The way, guys, that we purify our hearts and become a people of pure hearts is by putting to death our dualism. Such an encouraging word. I'm just here. I'm here for you all to encourage your hearts. You have to put it to death. How do we do that? How do we put our dualism to death? It just takes fresh surrender. It's not a complicated thing, honestly. It just takes fresh surrender. Um, I just, here, here's the deal, guys. Here, here's why I'm pushing into this. Most of you guys don't know my testimony. You don't know my story. You don't um, know my journey. But I was a professional duelist, okay? I, I have lived this life. I, I, I understand uh, the tension. I understand how the brain can work. I understand all the things we can rationalize when the Lord is dealing with our dualism. Um, for, for a five-year period, um, I had this crazy, uh, <laughs> I just realized I'm, I'm at the church where this story happened, so I have to be careful with these details. <laughs> um, I'll just do it. I'll do it. Okay. So I was, I was in high school here, and um, I, um, uh, I was infatuated with this girl here. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, but I was a homeschooler, so I never talked to her. So... Uh, that's just how we roll. <laughs> and, um, but at the same time, I'm kind of like planning and plotting our lives and all that kind of a thing. And, uh, and then just as if that's going to happen. And right out of high school, um, she starts, um, well, her and my youth pastor at the time uh, started going out. Yeah, let's, let's just have a moment. Let's just pause. And... Um, <laughs> No, it's good. They're actually amazing. They're a beautiful couple. Um, and, um, and it's actually incredible how the God has used them and used their life. But for me, as an 18-year-old coming out of high school, I did not see competition coming from that area, and I was utterly crushed and devastated. So I, I went on this journey with the Lord, and I turned to music for the first time. But let's just say this. Um, I wasn't writing worship songs. I was not writing beautiful love songs to Jesus. I was writing songs of heartbreak, um, songs of pain, songs of anguish. I was writing songs that uh, you would not sing these songs in church. And this thing that, that started there became this dream of making it a rock and roll. And I turned all of my drive for significance, my need to do something that mattered. Because for me, marriage in a minivan and a nine to five was like, that's personal death for me. I have to go after a life that matters. I need to do something something of significance. So this dream began to uh, be born in my heart, this dream of making it in, in rock and roll. And, um, and I went after it, guys, for five years. I, I went after this thing. And here is the weirdest thing about this whole five-year period where I'm in headlong pursuit of rock and roll. Is, is that I was battling dualism the whole entire time. I knew that the Lord had a call on my life, but I didn't fully want to surrender and find that out, you know? It's like in the back of my head, I'm like, I know that if I surrender, I'm going to be on the next plane to Africa. I've just, I know these stories. Like, this is how this is going to go down. Uh, and, and I don't want to go to Africa. I want to be Bono. I want to fill stadiums. I, Coldplay wasn't out yet, so I couldn't even, it was like, I, this is what I wanted to do you know, um, with my life. And um, I couldn't even bring myself to the point of surrender. But it was so ironic because in my heart, I wanted to serve the Lord. I did. I had a genuine de desire to serve the Lord, but I had these big dreams and passions and I wanted them both to be the Lord of my life. I just wanted them to get along. 
I wanted them to be comrades. <laughs> I didn't want it to have to be one or the other. And so your brain works overtime when, you, when, you're, when you're trying to rationalize this. And I wanted the Lord to understand that this could be a win-win for both of us. Like just a strong win-win. Um, and I tried the whole thing of, of bartering with the Lord. I'm like, Lord, if you make me famous, I'll make you famous. You know, you ever have those kind of conversations with Jesus? And I tried everything and anything um, uh, to rationalize and, and reason with the Lord, but I could not bring myself to surrender because the truth was I did not want to die. I didn't want to lay down my life. I didn't want to deny myself. I didn't want to take up my cross and follow him. And it took me, guys, a good solid five years to finally go, okay, I give up. I surrender to the Lord. And um, here's the scary truth. God can see right through all our smoke screens. He can see right to the heart, straight to the heart of our dualism, where it exists. Even when we have blinders up, the Lord sees straight to it. It's a scary question to ask God. I'm like, Lord, where are the areas of my dualism? Where, where am I trying to serve you? But actually, I'm really trying to do this just as much. But the Lord is able to speak right to it. There's a story in the Bible that says about the rich young ruler. And he had this genuine heart for the Lord. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you obey all these commandments. And he lists them all. And, and the rich young ruler says, well, I have. I have since I was a boy. I've done all these things. And it says the Lord looked at him and the Lord loved him. But he said, this one thing's lacking. Do you know that it's possible to live an incredibly good Christian life, guys, and be dualistic at your core, divided in your affections, divided in your attention towards the Lord? Jesus answered, one thing is lacking, sell all your possessions. <laughs> you know, it's not like it's a common thing for Jesus to tell people to do. He didn't tell every person that came to him. This wasn't about possessions. You guys understand that? This was about the point of dualism in his heart. This is about what was also on the throne of his heart. And Jesus was speaking right to that issue and saying, hey, this is, you know, this is what's lacking. Sell all your riches and give to the poor. If I were to paraphrase, he's basically saying this. Here's what you need to do. You need to dethrone riches and possessions from the ruling and leading seat on your heart, of your heart. And you need to enthrone me there instead. We love to sing, you have no rival. <laughs> and it's true, Jesus has no rival, except here. Except here in our hearts. That's where he has got a lot of rivals. Dualism doesn't work. It will stunt your growth. It will keep you from the fear of the Lord. It will keep you in perpetual compromise. It will keep your life fruitless and barren. And the thing I just want to encourage you today is to surrender again. I'm going to make a space for just fresh surrender. And honestly, guys, can I just encourage you in this? It may feel like it's impossible. You know, it's so funny that everyone, after Jesus told that to the rich young ruler, everyone in the room was like, holy smokes, who can be saved? And Jesus said this, he, he says, he said, with man, it's impossible, but with God, it's possible. And there is a grace, guys, that gets released for those of you who are just, you don't even know how to get there maybe, but there's going to be a grace that gets released in your life when you choose to surrender. It's not going to be by your power. It's going to be by his power that enables you to live this life. Surrender, get singular in your focus. And, and I hope you guys hear me that I'm talking about an inward work. I don't actually know what Jesus is going to speak to you. I don't know what's on the throne of your heart that's competing for his rule and reign in, in your life. I don't know those things, so I'm not going to pretend to speak those things. But most of you guys, it doesn't mean that you're going to quit your job or stop paying your bills or stop raising your family. Of course not. It's none of those kinds of things. This is about an inward posture where we purify our hearts by getting singular in what we're alive for. I'm going to get just a little bit more specific. I got it just a, just a teensy, teensy bit more time. Um, you guys are very familiar with the parable of the sower, right? <laughs> yeah, 
talks about the four different soil conditions. The first one, um, the seed doesn't have a chance. It gets sown, but the enemy, it says it snatches it up right away. The second soil condition is, is one where the, the, the soil is shallow, and it says that the seed gets sown, and it springs up immediately and, and so joyfully, but because it is not able to take uh, root when any kind of persecution or hardship or trials come, that the seed, it, it actually dies. But there's this third condition that I find so many of us live in this third place. And it's this. It says, I'm going to read. This is uh, Mark chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. And again, I'm so sorry for that. It's not up there for you. But it says, and others are the ones sown. Others meaning seed are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. And Jesus is bringing up three choking strongholds that I see have been very powerful choking strongholds in my life. The cares of this world, which is just anxiety, worry, what are we, what are we, what are we, what are we gonna eat? What are we gonna drink? What are we gonna wear? Um, Jesus, uh, there's this whole beautiful thing about Solomon and the lilies of the field and how they, clo- how they don't clothe themselves, but the Lord clothes them. And he's like, so stop worrying about all of this other stuff. Instead, it says what? Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first, singular. Seek first this, and all these other things will be added to you. The cares of this world, they're a major choking stronghold. Uh, Deceitfulness of riches. Um, here, I'll just say this um, for anyone who has riches and is feeling incredibly guilty for having riches. Uh, the point is, <laughs> this isn't, this is, riches are not inherently deceitful. It doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says what? The love of money is the root of all evil. But we have to watch that sucker. (laughs) Paul says this, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving, this craving, that many have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Desires, this is the thing that I'm going to really hammer. The desires, this is the other, this third stronghold. The desires for other things enters in. This is dualism at its finest. It says the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, leaving it unfruitful. And for some of you guys, the word of God is not bearing fruit in your life simply because it has way too much competition. I am, again, I want to speak so much grace to this journey. It's a journey we take baby steps, baby steps. Sometimes we, we, we despair in our journey with the Lord because, because we're, we're, we're trying to just run marathons when we, we haven't even learned how to walk. And so one of the things that I just want to straight, you know, uh, stress is I feel like in my life, how, let me just say this. How many of you guys are so glad that God does not deal with all your issues at once? Praise the Lord. Praise him for his mercy and his kindness. He does not deal with all your issues at once. He deals with them one layer at a time, one layer at a time. And if I were to look at my life, where I am now, I couldn't have fathomed of being there at like 22. Just couldn't have even imagined it because it's been one step, one series of consecration after another series of consecrations that has led me to the place. And let me just tell you this, if I could have just tasted the life on the other side of surrender, if someone had just given me a drop of a taste of the joy and the freedom and the life on the other side of laying down all the other stuff, I would have done it you know, in a heartbeat but we're crippled because we're actually drawing life from the other stuff. And we're afraid that if we let go of that life, then we won't have any life at all. But the truth is, is that the second you let go of that life, you will encounter his life. And there's no life like his life. No life like his life. Um, we're, we're at a season where my wife and I, I'll just share just closing here. Um, where we're actually living incredibly focused lives. But, but I can't be ignorant of the fact that that is in part because of the journey of letting all the other things go. Like we had a beautiful life in Reading. We were seven years on this property. We built the dream home on this property. I was expecting to be in a rocking chair in my 90s, you know, looking at that view. Um, we, we had land that we invested into. Um, I had gotten a boat, <laughs> lifelong dream. <laughs> I don't have that boat anymore. That's why I'm, that's why I'm, 
I'm languishing in my heart, but um, uh, I had a tractor, guys, and not just any kind of like piddly, like small tractor. This was like the dream tractor, okay? It was, uh, we had a whole life. Quads, all the toys, um, you name it. And um, we sold it all because we heard the Lord speak. And here's the thing, like, (laughs) <laughs> we, didn't have to, we didn't have to give that up. We didn't have to give that up. And yeah, it might've stung just a little bit, but holy smokes, the more I think about it, the more I just feel lighter and happier than I've ever felt in my life. And honestly, at this stage in our life, we came down here, we bought another house and we bought all the things. And now I'm like, hey, how can we slim our lives down even more? Because, um, because maybe because I just got like a $10,000 bill to trim my eucalyptus trees. And I'm like... <laughs> Who needs this home ownership stuff? Like it's, it's, uh, I'm looking at dry patches in my lawn. I'm like, my attention, I just feel it being pulled in all these ways. We start looking at apartments. I don't know if we're ever actually downsized to an apartment or not. But the whole point is, once you go on this journey, you begin to ask this question of like, how can we wrap as much of our lives as possible around the kingdom of God? Like, how can we focus our lives? How can we purify the, the devotion of our hearts so that it's so singular and so fiery and so focused that it leaves such a mark on the earth? Because who cares about a home that's going to be eaten by termites in 10 years anyway? You know what I'm saying? Down here in Southern California, it's just a warfare. And so it's like, <laughs> when you can leave a mark, a mark that lasts all eternity, that marks eternity just by letting go of all these other trappings and things that can so clutter our lives by dealing with the dualism of your own pursuits. Jeremiah says this, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. And that's the season that we're in. It is a season to break up the fallow ground. That's a, that's a field that's laid fallow. It hasn't, it hasn't been used for anything. So a bunch of weeds have grown in it and no farmer in their right mind would just go to that field and just sow seed. It wouldn't go anywhere. It would get choked out. So, it, so the, the, the command is break up your fallow ground. We're in a season, guys, as a church. It's a season of preparation. It's preparation for the seed that is going to be sown in our hearts that it would bear much fruit not be fruitless and barren. How many of you guys are tired of being fruitless and barren? I want to be a, someone who bears much fruit. It's time to prep the soil to remove the competition. Why don't we stand? Let me just say this. If repentance is not changing your habitual daily life, your decisions, your purchases, your thinking, your giving, et cetera, um, your heart might be postured in the right place, but it won't bear any lasting fruit. Repentance is so much deeper than, Lord, I'm sorry, so much deeper than a one-time confession. As anyone who's married knows, that does not get you very far in your marriage or in any relationship when you're just sorry, but you keep doing the same thing. It doesn't go very far. Repentance has to begin to change how we live, has to begin to change the core of how we think and go after things in life. And, you know, Lambert, sweet Lambert, gets picked on a lot by Alan here. <laughs> but the thing is, is like, the scariest thing about Lambert's, Lambert and Lynn's life, because this is just as much her life as it is his, um, it's not that they're actually super, super duper radical. It's that their life is so very attainable. And sometimes the trickiest part about weeding our hearts, God, guys, which is the application, it's, it's, it's what that text is, is, is screaming. The, the process of repentance is the process of weeding out the things that are choking fruitfulness. That, that, that's what we're here. But I think for some of us, we need to understand that that's not just sin. Hebrews says this, it says, lay aside. He says, let us run the race with perseverance. Let us lay aside every weight and sin. Sometimes I think we have a hard time discerning. We, we know what sin is, hopefully, most of us. We know what sin is, but a lot of us have a hard time discerning what our weights are. Because weights are not necessarily bad things. They can be good things. They can be hobbies, um, video games. <laughs> I don't mean to pick on that one, except I mean to pick on that one. <laughs> no, I, we all need 
relaxation. We all need all these things, these rhythms in our life. But, but what is adding to your fire? What's, what's helping you run the race that you were called to run? What things are actually just, they may be brilliant, they may be amazing, they may be friendships, they may be a, 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 a packed calendar, but what they're actually doing is they're weighing you down from running your race. All right. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm just going to make space up here for people who, who, who want to deal with God. And again, this isn't not, these, are, these are not the kind of ministry times that um, we're going to have a bunch of people praying. This is really something that's between you and the Lord. And I just want to say this is like, these are pearl of great price moments. Moments where we, we can choose a lot of different things. There's lots of choices, lots of options, but we have, we have, we have the invitation to recognize the kingdom of God in our midst, to recognize it as the pearl of great price, to set it, as I like to literally lay aside all the other things that will compete to sell everything and be like, we're going to get this. We want this. We, we don't want all the other things. We just want this. We know that if we get this, we'll have everything that we've ever wanted and dreamed of and more. We want this. We're going to prioritize this. Um, and I just, I'm just practically speaking, if you know you're dealing with dualism in your heart, if you know that there are areas that you have not yet surrendered, I want to make a space up here at the front for you to surrender. If you know that the Word of God is being choked out because you're just obsessed with all the details and the cares and the anxieties and worries of this life, I want to make a space up here for you to deal with that. Um, if you know that you're running after money, after stuff, after all this thing, if you know that that's just what you're chasing and, and you're living this dualistic life with the Lord, I'm going to give you an opportunity to repent. If you know that, that, that desire for other things could be great things, but it's competing in your heart. If you know there are weights and things in your life that you need to lay down, then I'm going to make a space up here. So if you know that's you, why don't you just come now? Jesus, first and foremost, I pray that you would just show us again how worthy you are, how worthy you are, how worthy you are. Show us again how zealous you are for our lives. Show us again how zealous you are for our hearts. Show us again your burn, this zealous burn of love for our hearts. And though we pray, because we know that you have no rival. <laughs> All authority in heaven and earth has been given to you. You have no physical rival, Lord, but may that be true in our hearts. Lord, I pray that it would be true in our hearts that you would have no rival. There would be no competition in our hearts. We want you. We want you. We want your kingdom. We want to seek first your kingdom. We want to give you what you deserve. Covenantal devotion, wholehearted, singular devotion. Nothing less than that. Nothing less, Lord.
Don't allow us to get away with anything less than the whole of our hearts. You have given the whole of yourself. You have not held one single thing back from us. Therefore, God, we will not hold one single thing back from you. Not one single thing. You can have it all. And we mean what we say, Lord. Every area where there is dualism in our hearts, every area where there's a competing desire, we say, Lord, come. You can have it all. We enthrone you. We dethrone every lesser thing every lesser thing and we say come take the highest place come take the ruling and leading seat on our hearts we will have no other gods before you we will have no other pursuits before you we will have nothing before you And now, Lord, I just release a grace. I release a grace on you to walk this out. Just a grace right now. Wherever that was like, I don't know if I can let this go. I don't know if I can give this up. I don't know. I just release a grace to you in the name of Jesus that you'd be able to do it with a smile on your face. That there would be freedom right now in Jesus' name. Freedom from the bondage, the possessing tie, the chain that's linking you to something lesser than what you were made for. And I release a grace right now to break all of those chains and all of those ties and to step in into the all-consuming nature of who he is, to give yourself fully to him. Let there be a grace now in Jesus' name. Lord, you're the one we love. We are so hungry for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. We're just saying right here, start with us, start right here. We love this region. We want to see you break out on this whole entire region. We know that you will do that, but Lord, we just say, start here with us. What's the point if it happens out there, if it doesn't actually happen in here? Lord, start here with us. We say, yes, here we are, Lord. Here we are. Start here with us, cleanse us, purify us, refine us, make us a people ready for all that you want to pour out. Break up. We break up our fallow ground. We break up the soil of our hearts, Lord, that may be infested with weeds or whatever it may be, Lord. We just, we break it up and we say, come, sow your seed on our field, Lord. Sow your seed in us, Lord, the kind of seed that has no competition, it has no rival that's destined for fruit. Jesus, I just thank you. I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. All of it, the ones that pierces us, the ones that lifts us up, all of it, God, the whole package, because we know that all of your word is leading us into life and a life abundantly. And we want life and we want life abundantly. Therefore, we will be a people who are responsive to your word, responsive to your voice, responsive to your Holy Spirit. If you say go, we go. Like if you say wait, we wait. We will be that people who step out on the water. If you bid us come, we will step out on the water. There won't be any hindrance. There won't be any looking back. When we put our hands to the plow, we will be a people who run with you, who rise up and do the impossible and run with the horses. We will be a people who run with you. And all God's people said, amen. Say it one more time.